so today we are going to discuss uh, discourse analysis and we will see that discourse analysis is the study of language in use in a social context. So basically how language as a social practice impacts the social world and how the social world impacts language. So we will be doing uh, quite a few things in today's discussion. So let us discuss about what are we going to uh, talk about in today's uh, presentation. So uh, we will uh, begin with a description of what is discourse and then we talk about Michel Foucault's uh, idea of discourse and how we can do a Foucauldian uh, discourse analysis. Uh, we will be talking in details about critical discourse analysis and also the linguistic method of discourse analysis and uh, what are described as the building task of languages. So we begin with a discussion on what is discourse. So as we discussed at the beginning, discourse analysis focuses on the use of language in social context. So basically we are talking about language in use. And when I refer to language, I refer to it either as a text or talk. So it could be a text, uh, a printed test, a text, it could be a, uh, uh, an audiovisual text or it could be talk and the social context refers to the social situation or the forum in which the text or talk occurs. So we are trying to look at the use of language in that social context. And we'll also see that discourse analysis hermeneutic at uh, one end where we are uh, uh, seeing how it can be interpreted and also phenomenological where we are studying the discourse itself as a phenomenon. And we are trying to emphasize the life world and the meaning making through the use of language. So through discourse we want to find out what is happening in the life world and how the meaning making happens through the use of language. So in discourse analysis language is used as a, social, as a form of social practice and how language influences the social world and how the social world influences the language that is what we are going to uh, uh, do in uh, a proper discourse analysis. Uh, we've been talking about uh, language in use and language in use basically uh, deals with the uh, micro dimensions of language. It could be about the functional grammar, it could be how these features interplay within a social context and we will uh, talk in details about uh, these language in use and how certain kind of languages uh, do uh, perform certain kind of activities. And it also focuses on the rules and conventions of talk and text within a certain context. So what are the rules and conventions that describe the use of language within a particular social context? So that social context is important. Uh, so when we talk of uh, discourse, we uh, have to understand that there are important connections when we are communicating. So uh, I'm, I'm doing, uh, I'm informing about a certain event. I am at the same time doing some kind of an action and I'm also enacting an identity. So uh, there are very important connections on what is being said, what is being done and what is the identity that comes across through that kind of a discourse. So to understand fully about uh, whatever is uh, there in the discourse, we need to understand who is saying it what is it that the person is saying and what is it that the person is trying to do. So in other words trying to look at important connections between saying, doing and being. And uh, context is a very very important uh, 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 term for uh, understanding discourse or its uh, context is extremely imp important for understanding what is uh, discourse. Because most of the times a lot of uh, uh, communication is implied. We never say exactly all that we mean. We rely on listeners or readers to use the context in which things are said. So lot of the things which are left unsaid are assumed to be inferable from the context. So. Uh, uh, whoever I am uh, communicating with, uh, that person would understand that what is the context in which a certain thing is being said or uh, not being said. So whatever is left unsaid is inferred by the readers. So that's a very important uh, 
idea of discourse to understand before we uh, uh, get on with what is discourse analysis. So uh, the other important thing is that uh, uh, the uh, discourse analysis has a socio-political context as well. So what uh, this socio-political context is concerned with how language forms the social context and how it influences the social context. So language, of course, forms the social context because the social context is uh, discussed in terms of language and uh, uh, that influences the so social context as well. So this socio-political discourse analysis uh, focuses on the social construction of discursive practices. So how that is constructed socially or how, how people uh, uh, see that uh, in that social uh, context. So this emphasizes that uh, social context is influenced by language and uh, socio-political uh, discourse analysts focus on, on the social context and the interplay between the social context and language. So as we said that how does the uh, social context influences the language or how language influences the social context and how one forms the other. So that's a, a very important uh, element of, of a socio-political discourse analysis. And as we'll keep emphasizing, there are very many ways of doing this course analysis. There is not one single way of doing this course analysis. So that's what we are trying to emphasize in today's presentation as well. So uh, now we begin with uh, Michel Foucault's idea about discourse. So uh, in the next few slides, we'll uh, try and give uh, uh, you a sketch of uh, what is uh, Foucault's idea of discourse and how we can do uh, Foucauldian uh, discourse analysis. So as we already know, Michel Foucault uh, uh, emphasized the role of discourse as power, discourse as reflective of power relations. And uh, to uh, study this uh, concept of discourse as power, he identified the concept of archaeology as a methodology. So Foucauldian uh, discourse analysis sees archaeology as a methodology for analyzing discourse. And uh, we'll discuss about archaeology and genealogy in the next few slides. So archaeology is the investigation of ideas which are unconsciously organized or it is even the investigation of artifacts which are unconsciously organized. So uh, it, it's not an, a conscious attempt to uh, uh, create a certain kind of discourse, but how these things are unconsciously uh, organized is what archaeology attempts to look at. So it is not interested in uh, establishing a timeline, nor is it interested in seeing uh, uh, history as, as a linear progressive thing uh, based on Hegelian principles. But it uh, uh, sees uh, discourse uh, through other local practices, which are which we are going to discuss in the next few slides. So uh, archaeology defines and identifies how discourses of knowledge objects, and uh, which is separated from a historical linear progressive structure. So it it uh, disproves a historical linear progressive structure. It does not believe in a historical linear progressive structure, but it sees uh, uh, the discourse as being formed of uh, uh, discrete elements. So archaeology consists of three important elements. And the first is the delimitation of authority. That means who gets to speak about the object of knowledge. For example, if we are uh, describing democracy, then who gets to speak about democracy? Or if we are uh, describing a development, then who gets to speak about development? And the second key element of archaeology is the surface of emergence. That when does discourse about an object of knowledge begin? At what stage uh, does this discourse begin? So for example, uh, when we talk about a particular idea of development, when does that discourse about development begin? And at the same time, we are also interested in a grid of specification. That means how the object of knowledge is described, defined and labeled. So archaeology looks at the delimitation of authority. That means who gets to uh, 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 speak about the object of knowledge, the surface of emergence, when does discourse about an object uh, of knowledge begin and grids of specification that how is that object of knowledge described, defined and labeled. And as I said, this object of knowledge could be anything about uh, 
it could be development it could be uh, uh, democracy it could be welfare it could be many other uh, things that we can talk about in our everyday uh, life world at the same time it's important also to understand the idea of genealogy so uh, uh, as we have seen archaeology's target is to deconstruct the history of ideas and how did it begin who got to talk about those ideas and uh, how are they described and labeled etc uh, genealogy basically focuses on the emergence of a discourse that how did it uh, begin and it identifies where politics and power surface in the discourse so it uh, talks of a uh, union of erudite knowledge uh, means systematic knowledge and also local memories so how uh, uh, it, it's constructed in local memories through uh, uh, what comes uh, uh, through erudite knowledge and that's a very interesting way of looking at uh, discourse so uh, the object of uh, the study of genealogy is subjugated discourses so genealogy basically uh, studies the subjugated discourses that are found through the use of archaeology so through archaeology we have identified certain subjugated discourses and within those subjugated discourses genealogy focuses on the uh, local discontinuous illegitimate knowledge which is opposed to the assertions of the totalizing discourses which is opposed to the uh, uh, mainstream discourses if i can use that term so it is the exploration of the power that develops the discourse and uh, this power in, in turn constructs an object of knowledge it uh, uh, constructs a discourse of development for example so the key elements of genealogy as i discussed in the last slide is uh, subjugated discourse that means we study whose voices were minimized or hidden in the formation of the object of knowledge so when we describe an object of knowledge whose voices were hidden there or whose voices were minimized at the same time genealogy also studies about local beliefs and local understandings and how the object of knowledge or whatever we are talking about is perceived in the social context so we uh, identify the object of knowledge and then we see that how is it perceived in the social context especially in terms of uh, local beliefs and local understandings at the same time we also study the conflict and the power relations that what are the disruptive uh, discursive disruptions and we'll talk about uh, disruptions when we talk about the methods of uh, discourse analysis and uh, how is it enact or how is power enacted in discourse and that's a very important point that discourse is an enactment of power and it's uh, it, it's all, it is also an enactment of power relations so through these uh, subjugated discourses we also study the conflict and power relations so genealogy became uh, is focused on why certain discourses are dominant and why certain are subjugated in uh, the construction uh, of an object of knowledge so the term that we keep using is an object of knowledge so how these discourses about certain objects are created so uh, as as we have discussed earlier archaeology is a method of data collection that we find out uh, what those uh, Uh, subjugated discourses are and uh, such things and the genealogy then analyzes that uh, 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 analyzes the data of that subjugated discourse for example so foucault's work is uh, the foundation of the uh, socio political discourse analysis that we discussed and uh, we'll also talk about the gramscian uh, discourse analysis before we uh, get into a discussion on critical discourse analysis So Antonio Gramsci approaches uh, uh, discourse functions as a medium for transmission, naturalization, and domination of particular ideologies over others, and uh, the uh, strategies used are consent and coercion rather than 
force. So the Gramscian approach is uh, about how discourse functions as a medium for uh, transmission, naturaliz naturalization and domination of particular ideologies. And uh, as we know, Gramsci referred to this consensual ideological dominan uh, domin dominance as cultural hegemony. And it leads to uh, social material outcomes via ideology. So it is basically uh, political in nature and uh, meanings are always relational uh, and shifting and they are always unfixed. So this is another way of uh, doing this course analysis. We've discussed about uh, the language in use. We've discussed about uh, the socio-political discourse analysis. We've discussed uh, uh, Foucauldian discourse analysis. And this is uh, what Gramsci has to uh, say about uh, discourse analysis. Uh, we now talk about critical discourse analysis, which is uh, one of the most uh, uh, important ways of doing discourse analysis. So critical discourse analysis focuses on social structures and discursive strategies that play a role in the reproduction of power. So what are the social structures at one end and what are the discursive strategies that play a role in the production and reproduction of power or how uh, the same, the, the same uh, power is, is uh, uh, exercised again and again. And uh, we'll see that this CDA, critical discourse analysis perspective is of course, influenced by the work of Foucault, but also uh, many other critical theorists, especially Jürgen Habermas. It rejects the concept, the critical discourse analysis rejects the concept that there is a value-free science, for example. And every discourse is influenced by social structure and is also created in, the, uh, in a particular social interface at that point of time. So that is why it studies the way in which power relations, domination and inequity are both reproduced in discursive practices and how they are resisted in discursive practices as well. How these power relations, how these uh, dominations and how these uh, inequities are resisted to in the discursive practices. So there are three central tenets of uh, critical discourse analysis. One is the social structure, that is the class, the social status, the age, ethnicity, uh, gender, etc. The culture, the, which means the accepted norms and behaviors in a society. And also the discourse, the words and language that we use. So these are interrelated in a critical discourse analysis. And uh, we basically uh, have three levels of analysis there. So. Uh, uh, the first is the text itself, which is the record of communicated event uh, that reproduces a social power as we've seen or, or uh, as we've uh, assumed. Then the discursive practice itself, which is the way of being in the world that signify accepted social roles and identities. So these discursive practices are ways of being or, or ways of uh, identifying yourself and also signifying which social roles uh, we have, uh, one has accepted and one identifies with and the socio-cultural practice uh, describes the distinct context in which discourse occurs so it, it uh, talks about the text itself the discursive practice and the socio-cultural practice so uh, text and talk are the description of communication that occurs in a social context and they are loaded with power dynamics as we've uh, said in uh, our earlier slides as well and this uh, and it is also loaded with structured roles and practices of power enactment so if we do not analyze it uh, critically then the oppressive discursive uh, discursive practices and we have uh, spoken of subjugated discourses earlier or, or about marginalized discourses earlier or even oppressive discourses so if we do not analyze this criti uh, critically then that would be accepted as normal and one would not be aware or one would not uh, understand that there are distinct power relations or, 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 or a distinct uh, socio-political context that lets the, those uh, disc discursive practices survive. So uh, CDA or the critical discourse analysis is intended to shine a light on such oppressive discursive practices. And uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it, is a, it involves a process of critique and its ability to raise consciousness about power in social context. So that is the foundation of the CDA. 
that it raises consciousness about power in a social context that these discursive practices uh, are about uh, power in a social context so uh, this uh, critical approach analyzes the latent uh, forms of domination along with the apparent forms of uh, domination and uh, also discrimination exploitation control and manipulation which is manifested in language use so how uh, the the uh, forms of domination and discrimination etc are manifested in language use uh, apparently directly and also latently so uh, this critical approach analyzes uh, these uh, forms of domination and discrimination and exploitation in the use of language and it also analyzes the social processes which influence the content creation and how these structures enable or constrain the decoding of the produced text by uh, individuals in their uh, local context so not only about how the content uh, content is created but how individuals decode it and how uh, people normalize it in their everyday life so along with the relations of power this uh, mode of analysis this critical discourse analysis considers the historical conditions along with the dominant ideologies that shape the construction of text uh, because uh, one of the important ideas or one of the ways in which power is exercised through discourse is by naturalization or when something is held as a background knowledge so uh, cda investigates what is it that is accepted as common sense or or as background knowledge or something which is which is regarded as natural which in fact is not natural so uh, cda looks into uh, the disc uh, discursive practices which are regarded as normal and uh, it, it tries to see what are the power relations that have led to the description of these practices as normal or common sense and that is where the power lies uh, as as uh, we just saw not through uh, coercion but through uh, 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 persuading people to uh, take this as normal so in the next six slides we are going to talk about uh, six important elements of uh, conducting this course analysis and we'll see that uh, uh, whatever type of discourse analysis we do these things can be uh, uh, used in, in those cases so uh, at it's very basic we could be doing a content analysis and uh, in another video i have discussed uh, uh, in a detailed manner about how to do content analysis uh, we could also be talking about narrative analysis about uh, patterns people find in their lives and situations and also conversational analysis which looks at the structure of dialogue so when there is uh, conversation on communication how does that uh, go ahead so we could be doing content analysis we could be doing narrative analysis or we could be doing uh, conversational analysis so the first and the most important task of uh, the discourse analysis process and uh, it could be uh, involving any of the processes we have discussed so far it could be a, a linguistic way of seeing how language works or it could be a critical a discourse analysis of seeing the power relations in those discursive practices so we start by defining the key concepts and then uh, suggesting that uh, these are the operational definitions of these concepts that we want to study in our uh, particular analysis and then we select different types or genres or uh, sources of discourse for detailed examination it could be a, a newspaper article it could be a television uh, text it uh, it could be a cinema it could be any uh, such text which exists and uh, we could be selecting uh, different types of these texts or different genres or different diff different sources for a detailed examination the second thing that needs to be done for the discourse analysis is understanding the social context so uh, the first uh, important thing to understand is uh, trying to find out about the authorship of the text that we have selected that means who produced the text when was it produced where was it produced why was it produced and what is the intention of this particular text so through authorship we try and understand one element of the social context 
the second element we try and find out is about the audience so that who is the intended audience who is it intended for and how has this material been disseminated to them how uh, how do they have access to these materials and under what conventions or circumstances is the audience expected to engage with this material and then we also find out about the elements of the source material itself what is the genre what is its content and what is its form whether the content and the form of the material or the text is consistent with uh, other uh, texts of the same genre or is it different and uh, all such things so these three uh, questions help us understand the social context of the discursive practice a very very important uh, uh, part of uh, discourse analysis is in practicing reflexivity trying to analyze our own positions and how they influence our perception and analysis of materials under examination and that's a very important uh, uh, thing to do and that uh, begins by suspending pre-existing categories and uh, one important way that we can proceed with the uh, uh, critical discourse analysis is by suspending the tendency to interpret discourse according to preconceptions and pre-existing categories because those preconceptions and pre-existing categories are also a reflection of existing power relations so if we uh, see discourse or interpret discourse through our existing uh, uh, conceptions and uh, categories then uh, uh, we will not be able to critically analyze uh, the power relations behind those discursive practices so that is why an analysis of our own epistemology how do we know about certain things about our own ontologies what do we regard as uh, uh, knowledge and our own ideologies assumptions biases political ideas and even positionalities our, our gender our race our ethnicity income etc and how they may influence our perception and analysis of the uh, discourse texts because this will make uh, uh, others understand uh, the 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 uh, exact power relations behind those discursive practices and it will make our work, uh, work a lot more transparent So uh, there are two different uh, ways of coding that uh, happens in the discourse analysis. So one is the descriptive uh, coding phase. So there we uh, take account of the content, the, the subject, the structure and organization, the grammar, the vocabulary, the intertextuality, the rhetorical devices or the literary devices. And we uh, make a detailed study of functional grammar of, of a language there, uh, if, if I may use the term. So that is the descriptive phase and then we uh, talk about the interpretive phase which, expo which aims to expose the implicit and explicit presence and privileging of particular meta narratives. So are they or is that particular discourse privileging a particular meta narrative or a particular world view or a particular kind of language or does it privilege a particular ideology or a particular assumption or a particular unexpressed premises or even norms or prescriptions of act for action or subject positions or power relations so all these are implicit and explicitly present in the discourse so the interpretive phase aims to expose these implicit and explicit uh, 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 privileging of a particular meta narratives the world views epistemologies and all these things that we have discussed and it also uh, tries to study how the discursive uh, patterns and relationships within and across the source materials may work together to privilege to legitimate and to normalize or serve particular interests so how the discursive patterns and relationships across source materials not only in the ones that we are studying at the moment but across the source materials how do they privilege how they legitimate how they normalize or how they serve particular interests agenda and the power relation at the expense of others 
because when they are privileging one kind of uh, 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 power relation or agenda or interest or or or, or world views etc they are doing uh, at the same time they are silencing uh, other world views so uh, how uh, do these things work and then we use these insights to help explain uh, how these patterns and relationships relate to society itself Another important thing to realize in a discursive practice is to recognize inconsistencies and by inconsistency we mean a very different thing here. This means that how certain discourses might appear different. So they might suggest that they are doing certain benevolent things that the discourse itself for example uh, during colonial times all the colonial powers would suggest that they were uh, working for the welfare of the people so the discourse would suggest uh, uh, some kind of benevolence on the surface but at the same time working diametrically opposite working to uh, 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 in, in fact uh, uh, deprive the people whom they uh, were supposed to be uh, working for so that is uh, what is about recognizing inconsistencies so where we reveal how certain discourses appear uh, uh, to be doing certain things or appear to be well meaning when exactly they are doing the opposite so that again is an important element of discourse analysis and uh, also we find out what are the dom uh, what are the marginalized or the alternative discourses that are actually absent in the uh, dominant discourses so which are the marginalized or the alternative voices and perspectives which are not present in the discourse so are certain perspectives granted more authority than others and do some other perspectives tend to suppress others so that is why these discursive silences and uh, you will recall we studied about subjugated discourses some time back so paying attention to these uh, types of silences can help us find out the regimes of truth and what are the power relations so what are the power relations which lead to certain voices being regarded as natural and others being excluded and uh, that again is a, a very important thing in discourse analysis and the sixth important thing that we do is about find out what are the discourses and knowledges which uh, seem natural and legitimate and authoritative or even commonsensical so uh, when we are uh, provided with discourses or represent uh, representations that appear as if they are natural and true and if we do not question that then we would not be uh, investigating the power and the knowledge mechanisms which are involved in uh, validating them as true so they are not uh, natural in, in, in the natural sense but there are power relations which have led them to be recognized as uh, natural or commonsensical. <clears throat> so in the next few slides we are going to talk about how language performs certain functions in a discourse. So this is more a functional analysis of language itself from a, a linguistic science perspective. So in the next few slides we are going to talk about those uh, building tasks of languages for example uh, in general terms there are three primary speech functions so they could be a, a, a demand there could be an offer there could be a question there could be a statement so uh, these statements of facts predictions and evaluations are what we are trying to uh, look at at a very very basic level whether there is a demand or whether there is a prediction or whether there is an evaluation or whether there is a statement of fact and whether what is presented as a communicative action or just as a communicating device is in uh, uh, reality a strategic device or it's an instrumental way to achieve certain ends so uh, one way is to look at the speech functions of the uh, language in a given uh, discourse so uh, one of the things that we look for is how the words and other grammatical devices are used to make certain things appear more significant while at the same time downplaying the importance and relevance of other events so this is from james paul g and uh, the next uh, few building tasks are also from his book on an introduction to discourse analysis so we try and find out how certain words and grammatical devices are used to make certain things more significant 
also we are trying to find out that what activities are or practices are enacted through communication so for example if we use formal language then we are performing or we are uh, practicing a certain activity if we are using off the record language or if we use a, a small talk language then we are actually performing a different kind of an activity so the use of a formal language or a small talk language is what describes the activity being performed in that particular uh, discursive text also what are the different roles that are enacted through the use of language so uh, through the use of language how do we identify ourselves so what are the socially recognizable identities that we enact uh, uh, through the use of language so am i talking as a head of a department am i talking as a leader am i talking as a uh, as, as a co-worker, as a colleague, or or or, or as a subordinate uh, worker. So uh, this uh, enacting I an identity is is uh, uh, through the use of certain languages. So through the use of languages, we might uh, uh, be talking in a manner of of a head of a committee, and uh, through use of some other languages, uh, we could be uh, enacting our identity as a co-worker. Uh, language can also be used to convey a perspective on the nature of distribution of social goods. So uh, if I say or if I write that uh, X company loaded its operating system with bugs, that very moment I am uh, using politics or, or, or uh, the, the politics of the distribution of social goods here suggests that this company X is culpable and I deny them a social good. I regard them as, as, as a company which is responsible for certain ills. So we use language to convey a perspective uh, about uh, the distribution of social goods. So that is regarded as the politics function of language. Uh, through uh, the use of language, we can also signal the sort of relationship uh, we are trying to achieve. So it could be a deferential relationship, it could be a formal relationship, or it could be very friendly so discourse analysis uh, traces the kind of relationship that are sought to be enacted by the communicator uh, it also talks about uh, meanings in a specific situations so in a particular situation a statement could be a fact and in any other situation it could be a challenge so uh, seeing the meanings in in that particular context is important uh, so so the, so this linguistic analysis of discourse sees uh, uh, how uh, uh, language takes uh, uh, particular meanings in specific situations and uh, uh, very importantly whether certain texts open up the possibility of interaction with the participants so there are certain discursive texts which uh, are open to dialogue so whenever we see a particular discourse which is open to dialogue so uh, that that means it, it is open to uh, dial dialogicality there are other uh, discourses where there is a struggle or conflict over norms and uh, the uh, other other discursive practice or other dialogical practice could be an attempt to uh, resolve or overcome differences while uh, other, at, at uh, other times we might even be trying to normalize and suppress the differences between uh, meanings and norms so how uh, how does a particular uh, text uh, uh, live up to dialogicality is an, another thing that we can do in discourse analysis so we have tried to provide uh, you an understanding of uh, critical discourse analysis and also how it uh, we can have a, a linguistic analysis of a discourse as well so thank you for your patience